Before we begin our main theme tonight, I want you to join me in a journey across the highlands of the planet Mars. And this is based upon genuine photographs sent back from the Viking probes, and they being computer combined into a very realistic film. And here we go. We are over the Tharsis area with those huge volcanoes far taller than our Everest. And I think you'll agree it is going to be a most spectacular journey. And we'll take you on some more of that journey across Mars at the end of the program. Meanwhile, Voyager 2 is still on its way to the planet Neptune. It'll get there in late August. And a few weeks ago, it sent us back the best photographs of Neptune yet. These were taken from a distance of 130 million miles, only 90 minutes apart. You can see there the Neptune shows a slight phase, and the full disk is shown by that white line to the right of each image. But look at those cloudy features there. They've never been seen before, anything like so clearly. And one of those is just about the same size as the famous great red spot on Jupiter, though, of course, it's not red, and Neptune is a very different kind of world. I can't really say we yet know a great deal about Neptune. We'll know a great deal more in a few weeks' time. You know, when we began our Sky at Night programs, way back in 1957, the world's largest telescope was the Palomar 200-inch reflector. And not only was it the world's largest, and more or less in a class of its own, it was also fairly new, less than 10 years old. Well, since then, there's been one larger single mirror telescope, the Russian 236-inch. But there had been tremendous improvements in telescope design, quite apart from the fact that they are now used mainly with electronic devices instead of cameras. But we have new kinds of telescopes, new kinds of mirrors, various multiple mirror telescopes working together, all kinds of things. In fact, the whole science of telescope optics has been revolutionized. I am no optical expert, and so I'm delighted to welcome back yet again one of our most regular and welcome visitors, Dr. Ron Madison. Welcome back, Ron. Now, when you're faced with making a mirror the size of the Palomar 200-inch, for example, there are plenty of problems to be faced. Yes, the, the biggest problem of all, of course, is the sheer fact that the glass of the mirror weighs about 14 and a half tons. And that isn't how it was made. When it was cast, it had about five tons more. And that had to be ground and polished away. But the difficulty with the telescope design is the fact that a thin film of aluminium, which is the reflecting surface on the mirror, has to be supported and maintained to within about a two millionth of an inch all over the surface. As the telescope tilts to point to different parts of the sky, so the force of gravity brings all those 14 tons onto one edge of the mirror. And there's a certain amount of distortion taking place. And you can imagine that it's very difficult to keep a surface of that accuracy uh, for different angles of presentation. And that's why the telescope itself is such an enormous structure. 500 tons of heavy steel work just to support the optical surfaces relative to one another. But making an optical surface accurate to millions of an inch sounds a tremendous problem. Well, it is. The making of a telescope is a very largely labor-intensive business. You're grinding away at glass to remove it. But even so, you would think that measuring a, a surface to that accuracy would be difficult. And yet amateurs have been using a, a test that was developed by Leon Foucault uh, for many years. It's called the knife edge test. And uh, really, it involves some very simple equipment, like, for example, a point source of light and a knife edge. And the mirror that you're testing uh, some distance away. Uh, I can demonstrate the principle just by uh, following through the rays of light on a diagram. Here, uh, you can imagine a pinhole source of light over on the left shining all over the surface of the mirror from a point at the radius of curvature of the mirror. That is, uh, the light strikes the surface at right angles all over. The light reflects back and would normally produce an image of the pinhole at the pinhole. Of course, you wouldn't be able to see it there. So what you do in practice is just to shift it to one side. You have the pinhole and you have the focus point that you can look at. Now, if you were looking through a, such a system and you had to hand a sharp knife and you were to bring that knife into the beam at a point that lies between the mirror and the focal point, then you would see uh, in your uh, eye view of it that the knife edge appears to come across the view from the opposite side. You can see why the, the light beams cross between, between your eye and the knife edge. So you insert the knife, and the shadow appears to cross the mirror from the opposite side. If now you put the knife edge at a point between the focal point and your eye, you get the opposite effect, because here now you're intersecting a beam on the same side that it's entering your eye. So as you put the beam in, uh, the image goes dark from that same side. 
The trick, of course, comes when you put the knife edge into the focal point. Here, theoretically, if the pinhole is small enough and the surface is a sphere, it will darken all over instantaneously. But this allows you to see any particular imperfections that might be on the surface. If, for example, there's a little patch on the mirror where there's a hill, perhaps a millionth of an inch high, uh, then light reflecting from that hill is not going to pass through the focal point. It'll pass before it or after it. And so you'll see that little bit of the mirror either dark or light. And you get an exaggerated three-dimensional view, almost like a, uh, an exaggerated uh, shot down on a, a contour map. And there you can see uh, on the diagram at the top there what a hill would look like. You can devote your attention to getting rid of that. And you can make a very accurate surface very cheaply. As a matter of fact, I've got a setup in the studio here to demonstrate that very piece of equipment. Well, over there is a 17-inch mirror which is on test. And we've arranged it to be at the radius of curvature away. Now, in this box is a, an ordinary torch bulb with a thin piece of aluminium foil containing a needle hole, a very small pinhole of light. And this is a swinging razor blade which can be made to move across the focal point which is just about here. If we look through the camera you'll see the effect of the Foucault test and looking into the mirror as the lights go down you'll see that there is in fact a shape there. You can see that that is a hollowed mirror. It's a paraboloid in this particular case and it looks definitely uh, as if it's moving. Now that's because of turbulence in the air in this room. This is a very sensitive test. Patrick, could you just put your hand into the beam there and you'll see the effect of the heat of Patrick's blood. Heating the air, changing the refractive index, appearing like smoke rising or falling from his hand. Yes, that's quite incredible. And of course, bear in mind also, Don, we mustn't with it, the um, glass is not the very best material because it does tend to expand and contract according to changes in temperature. Yes, there have been vast improvements. That's ordinary borosilicate glass, which expands a lot. But there are glasses now called zero dur and uh, uh, materials which have actually zero thermal expansion, and these are used in modern telescopes. Well, uh, every trick has to be used. And we all know the efforts made to make mirrors which are bigger than the Palomar 200-inch, and the Russians actually have done it with their 236-inch. Yes, they were really rather unfortunate with that one because uh, although it was a, an aperture of six meters, clearly a very a big advance in area, uh, there you see the mirror with uh, an enormous area of glass. Uh, they never were too lucky with the optical quality. They fitted the telescope with a second mirror and even now they're troubled with problems of temperature and turbulence in the air in the dome. But clearly they were able to demonstrate that it, you'd gone beyond the limit for the single large monolithic mirror. It was too difficult to handle. But one very successful point that they were able to make was that you could break away from the conventional telescope mounting design. And what they have here is a, an altitude azimuth system, which is shown very clearly on this photograph of the system mounted like a gun, uh, so that it's able to move around the horizon and vertically up and down. I think you can see the advantage of this if you compare the two sorts of mountings. On the left is a conventional fork mounting equatorial mount. Uh, what you have here is an axis which is made parallel with the Earth's axis of rotation so that you can simply drive the telescope with one motor. That was the big advantage, one motor drive. But uh, engineers do not like that for a very heavy telescope. Look at the very cumbersome 200 inch. Uh, all the weight of the telescope is on the bottom bearing. It's clearly an asymmetric structure as far as gravity is concerned. It's much better to have uh, a mounting like you see on the right, which is the altazimuth system again, where everything is symmetrical. The telescope is mounted in a fork and the thing can move around on the hor horizontal bearing in that way. And what you can see here is that you can drive the telescope, but you need two motors. Now, at the time that the Russians built this one, they had recently invented the computer drive, stepping motors, and you could control two motors very precisely uh, in a complicated track across the sky to track stars. And that certainly worked very well. I wonder, Ron, whether anyone will try and make another 236-inch. On the whole, I rather doubt it. And I think, for one thing, one of the problems with the Russian telescope was that the mirror was too thick. Therefore, it just couldn't, couldn't cool down in time. Yes, that's certainly true. There were lots of thermal problems with that, and uh, the surface was never very reliable. You could start an evening's observing and end <laughs> up with the thing still changing shape 
well into the observing session. Well, if you don't want a really huge mirror, there are ways around it now. And I'm thinking, of course, of the multiple mirror system, as was pioneered by the MMT, or Multiple Mirror Telescope, on Mount Hopkins in Arizona. Yes, this was a most beautiful design. Here is the first breakthrough and a new technique in astronomy. This is the technique of having an active optical system. Now, the principle is very simple. You let the telescope distort, and providing you can measure it distorting, then you can correct it, and you can correct it in a very novel series of ways. This multi-mirror telescope made, was made of six individual mirrors, each one 1.8 meters across, and they produce a single image. But the, in this case, the active element, in a sense, is uh, achieved by moving the secondary mirrors, which are the uh, light collectors from the primary mirrors, which focus the images together to produce a single coherent image. When the telescope distorted, as it ine inevitably does as it tilts, uh, allowance is made. You measure the distortion using a laser beam. And of course, it was the advent of the laser that led directly to this development. You measure it with a laser beam. Then you can correct it with an hydraulic jack. But these jacks operating on the secondary mirrors. So this was the first attempt at an opti uh, active optical system. And that directly moved into the system uh, which is typified by the Keck telescope. Now, here is a remarkable telescope, well under construction now. It's high up on a mountain in Hawaii, the Mauna Kea Observatory. And it's a set of mirrors built together with an effective area, total light collecting area, of over 10 meters. But in this case, it's made of 36 individual mirrors. Now, each one of these mirrors is the same aperture as one of the multi-mirror telescope mirrors. So there's an enormous gain in light collecting power. But the trick here is that this is a simple mechanical system which is set up with the telescope pointing vertically. All the mirrors are adjusted to make one big smooth surface to that required accuracy. Over uh, an evening's observing, as the telescope is tilted, each mirror senses the position of its neighbor by means of an electrical coupling, which generates a signal which goes to the computer, which tells the uh, telescope how to change its shape with an hydraulic jack to keep that original figure. How are the mirrors supported? Well, it, the best way to see how the mirrors are supported is to look at a conventional mirror cell. And as it happens, this is the mirror cell for the 24-inch reflector we have at Kiel. And I brought it along to show the rather complicated system of supports under the mirror. In this case here, we have a set of these pads uh, mounted on triangular sections, each linked by a bridge. But essentially, these 18 points of suspension give uh, an equal weight uh, sharing among the pads, and yet the support is from three central points. So when the telescope is being lined up, it's just an adjustment of these three points that allows the attitude of the mirror to be made uh, exactly what you require. Now, in the case of a Keck telescope, these 36 of these mirrors have to be supported in exactly the right register with one another. And so each of the mirrors has its own support system, which is a rather complicated setup. It's rather like this. Um, this cutaway model shows one of the hexagonal mirrors. And in the center at the back is a thin metal disk, which is thin because it's meant to be pliable. And it's fixed in the center by a rigid bar mounting it to the steel work of the cell. In that case, these steel locating disks keep each of the mirrors in exactly the same positions. But the three suspension points are made to op be operable by jacks and hydraulic screws and all sorts of uh, subtle systems so that the telescope can be, uh, each mirror can be moved and kept in register exactly how it was designed to be. And this is a very careful system. In the case of the, each one of these mirrors, uh, the drive systems are capable of move, moving the surface by less than a millionth of an inch in a step. I gather the building of the Keck telescope is going well. Yes, I understand that more than uh, two mirrors are made now. Maybe three are on site, I'm not sure. Well, when we last went to Monarchia, the Keck dome wasn't there, which is fully up, up now. But what we did see when we went over to La Silla in Chile uh, earlier on uh, was the NTT, or New Technology Telescope. And that's revolutionary, but of course we're back here to a single thin mirror. Yes, the big breakthrough in this case was making, uh, breaking away from the multi-mirror system. This is very expensive. Why not go to a thin mirror, let it distort, in fact encourage it to distort by putting a lot of jacks underneath it. Uh, you make it very thin, and you change the shape as required. 
This shows the uh, mirror system as it was installed in the NTT, and you can see there's a very complicated set of actuators on the back. Now, in order to maintain the image quality, the image through the telescope is sampled at every stage of observing, and any distortion of any part of the surface is registered, and by a closed-loop system in a computer, uh, certain of the jacks are meant to operate, and ch thus changing the surface of the mirror to keep the exactly required figure. And in order to see how this works, you showed last month, yes, I think, indeed. the... Uh, first results from this telescope. Yes, it, it saw first light in March, and this is a photograph taken of the center of the Omega Centauri globular cluster with a 3.6 ordinary reflector. And if you look carefully at the little triangle of stars in the center there, you'll see how blurred they appear. Look now at the first picture taken with the NTT, and you can see three times the resolution. Well, it's most impressive. Well, Ron, what do you think comes next in telescope development? Well, I'm sure what comes next, because uh, there is a new development exploiting another engineering advance where you can actually generate curves on mirrors of approximately the right shape simply by using rotating furnaces, a technique developed over at the University of Arizona. And what happens in this particular case is a simple principle that you can demonstrate with a, a small tank of water on a rotating table. Just look at this. As you spin the tank, so the uh, centrifugal force drives the water up the surface of the vessel, and you generate a curved surface. Wouldn't it be nice if you could do this with molten glass? And, of course, the trick that's been developed is that you can do this. You use a great furnace uh, loaded with pure glass, which is then melted, and it's spun something like eight times a minute, and the glass rises up the walls of the vessel. Um, then you have to cool it sufficiently quickly to keep that curve and make the glass rigid enough to preserve its shape while you anneal the glass. And that's been done, certainly on demonstration discs, and it's going to be the basis of new telescopes of the future including probably the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, which in fact is going to be made up of four very large mirrors, all working together. Yes, each one of these mirrors is going to be eight metres across. Separate telescopes, in fact. Separate telescopes, which are capable of independent use while the thing is being built. But eventually, when the four telescopes are operating together as an interferometer system or as a single telescope, you'll have a light-collecting area effectively 16 metres across. It looks as if the engineering technique is capable of making mirrors up to eight metres across. And that should, in fact, be ready by very early in the next century. Yes. I wonder, one. you know, we've had tremendous development over the last 30 years. Where do you think we're going to go from here? Oh, I'm sure we're going to get tremendous discoveries in astronomy. Uh, as these new telescopes come online and we get a new technique and a new engineering breakthrough, inevitably, it's always the case, you get a new technique, a new breakthrough, you get fundamentally new discoveries. And I think we're at the beginning of a vast phase of expansion. Exciting times lie ahead. Ron, thank you very much. And now, finally, let's go back to our journey over Mars. And this is where we're going to go. Here are the volcanic areas, and that wiggly blue line indicates where we're going to go, and we're going to swoop down to only three miles above those huge volcanoes. So, as we journey to Mars, for the moment, until next month, good night.